Good evening, student. Well, at least it's evening when I'm recording this. Uh, and I'm glad that you are joining me for this uh, short uh, screencast, about maybe 12 minutes, maybe up to 15, I'm not sure yet. Uh, it's about explaining to you Lagrange multipliers. In fact, this uh, screencast is mostly about pro providing the formal proof for the Lagrange multiplier technique. And then I will spend uh, just a couple of minutes to give you a graphical uh, interpretation of uh, Lagrange multipliers. So that's uh, what I'm going to do now. The, go the objective uh, here is to uh, prove this relationship that we have here. And uh, I hope that you will be convinced uh, for the, in the next uh, few minutes. Now, uh, one thing that uh, we need to start with is a little bit of preliminary result, which is called the reciprocity theorem. So the first thing that I would like to uh, prove to you is this theorem that's uh, on this slide here. Um, and it's, uh, it's in fact a, a theorem that comes in very uh, handy in the other courses in physics. For example, in uh, thermodynamics, we use that equation quite a bit. Um, let's go for it. So reciprocity theorem, as you know, when we talk about differential equations and that kind of things, we come up uh, very often with uh, differentials. And so we are going to imagine a function of two variables. Uh, everything that I'm going to say here is going to be a function of two variables. Of course, we can expand this, to, expand this to many variables. So imagine that you have a function x, which depends on two variables y and z. And of course, as we know from elementary calculus, we can calculate the element dx, uh, which involves the uh, partial derivative of x with, versus, uh, with, with uh, respect to y and the uh, derivative of x uh, with respect to z. Uh, here, the, the subscript, which I will omit for most of the screencast, really mean that those partial derivatives are calculated at constant uh, while keeping the other, other variable constant. So, for example, uh, dx over dy at, at constant z means that we keep z constant. I think that it's very useful for students to remember this when they perform the differential, so that way they don't make a mistake of uh, adding terms that should not be there. So, of course, when we do a function x, which is x of, for example, y, z, we can also say that z is a function of x, y, right? It's another viewpoint. Uh, we can uh, formally write that z equals z of x, y. And uh, we can also, of course, calculate uh, the element dz the same way as we've done before. And so here, the, the trick is that we would like to um, substitute what's in the gray box here, so the dz, inside the dz of the first equation that I started with. So you do this, you substitute and you collect all the terms for dz, and you obtain this, this uh, equation. And you see in this equation, which I'm going to reproduce on the top of the next slide uh, now, uh, you see that uh, we have terms of dx on the left and dx on the right and dy. And as you know, the dx's and the dy's are independent from each other, so they're arbitrary. And so what we, we, uh, what we do here is to identify the different terms. And of course, we, can, we actually obtain two theorems, it turns out, for the price of, of, of one. And the first theorem we get is by looking at the dx term. And we say that on the left, on the right, the coefficients in front of dx should be the same. And therefore, we obtain what's called the reciprocal theorem. And the reciprocal theorem tells us that dx over dz at constant y is actually 1 over dz over dx at constant y. This is a shortcut that students tend to take anyways, but they should not take this uh, result for granted. It's actually uh, rooted in a fundamental uh, result. But what really is of interest to us in this screencast here is the terms in front of dy. Clearly, there's no dy on the left, on the right. So therefore, the only way for this equation to be always correct for every um, dy, infinitely small dy, is for the term in front of it, which is in the blue box, to be equal to 0. Uh, so that's a very important relationship. And in fact, when we rearrange the term very simply like this, we obtain a very important theorem that if you have three variable x, y, and z, and which are function of each other, the derivative of x with respect to y is equal to minus the derivative of x with respect to z times the, the, the partial derivative of z with respect to y. Um, frankly, this is not a result that's, um, that's obvious to uh, students who see this for the first time. Actually, the result, what is really not uh, intuitive is the minus sign. Uh, many students take uh, the shortcut of um, 
of simplifying some some delta, some some partial derivative, and so on, which of course we uh, always remind them that you should not do that. And so, in fact, this is a proof here that if you do, if you were to do that, uh, you would have a problem understanding why you have a minus sign. So the point is that this result here is going to come in handy in a few minutes in my proof of the Lagrange multiplier equation. So I'm ready for that. So this is the Lagrange multipliers, and I'm going to now prove this equation uh, which we use um, so often and so, uh, in my, and so, so importantly in, in, for example, theoretical mechanics, but in all optimization problems under constraint. So let's go back, let's go to the Lagrange multiplier and, uh, and let's, let's uh, set, a, set up the stage. So the stage is that we have a function f of two variable x, y, and as I said before, it's in generality we can use more than two variables, here we just use two. And we suppose that it has a minimum at x0, y0. And uh, therefore, we can, uh, we can write that the, the gradient of f at x0, y0 is 0. So that's, that's fine. Now, what we want to do is to, uh, th that would be true without constraint. Now, imagine that we want also to minimize the function at a point x0, uh, y0, uh, under the constraint that g of x, y is equal to 0 at the constraint, right? So we have a constraint that's expressed by a function g, x, y. Now, how do we actually now take into account the fact that there is a constraint in order to understand what's happening? Well, let's have a, let's have a, a look at the constraint, which is a function g, x, y. And this is where we are, I'm going to use uh, the reciprocity uh, theorem right now. Okay, so we have this function, and we, we are going to suppose that the gradient of g, x, y uh, is not zero at this point x0, y0. So we are going to suppose that we have this result. So again, as you know, a gradient is a two-dimensional vector in this case, so that's the, so the two components, not the two, the two components cannot be zero at the same time. So for example, imagine for this particular uh, demonstration here, that the second component, so the derivative of g with respect to y, is different from zero. Of course, you could do the same thing for g with respect to x if you wanted to, but this is a very first important result that we are having. So keep in mind that the, the, uh, the partial derivative of g with respect to y is not equal to zero. Now, we also have, what we have is a function of x and y. So g, x, and y. And this is where we are going to use the reciprocity theorem I just told you a minute ago, uh, which actually states that the derivative of g with respect to x is minus the derivative with y with respect to x times the derivative of g with respect to y. And if we rearrange the term, I can get a very interesting result with the derivative of y to respect to x. And I can rearrange the term here because we assumed, actually we imposed the fact that the derivative of g with respect to y uh, was different from zero, right? So otherwise I could not do the, I could not uh, divide by uh, the derivative of g with respect to y as I did on the right hand side here. Uh, I, I also like to, to really insist on something that's important, is that those, all those derivatives are going to be uh, are actually evaluated at the point x0, y0. So all those on the left, on the right, are actually numbers. So that's going to come important in a minute. So we have this first result that's actually, uh, I would say, almost halfway through the demonstration. We have this result here. Now, we have the two variables x and y, and let's say that suppose that we have a trajectory x, y, and we can certainly say that the, 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 the y component, the y variable, is also a function of x. So now we can actually say that y is a function of x, so we can write y as y of x. In other words, the constraint can be written uh, this way, certainly can be written this way and is equal to zero if we are on the constraint. And of course, if we say that y can be written as y of x, we can also do the same for the function we want to minimize, which is x, uh, function of x, y of x. So far, very elementary, nothing really complicated. And now we have the second result that we want to have in order to get to the Lagrange multiplier is to calculate the derivative of f with respect to x. And of course, you know how to do this when you have a function of x and y of x, you use a chain rule. And the chain rule tells tell us that the derivative of this function with respect to x 
would be first the derivative of f with respect to x plus the derivative of x with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to x. And you see where we are going with this because we are starting to see elements that we have seen before. And finally, and uh, so this is the second result we have, and I will summarize them on the next slide. But before I do that, I'd like to introduce a definition. And the definition I'm going to introduce is the number lambda, which we will call later the Lagrange multiplier, which is the ratio of the number of the derivative of f with respect to y divided by the derivative of g with respect to y at the uh, at x naught y naught. Again, these are numbers, and I can divide by that number because I assume that the gradient was not equal to zero. Um, of the gradient of g was not equal to zero. Again, let's try to be rigorous and make sure that we can divide by something that's not equal to zero. So in the past uh, seven or eight minutes, I showed you three results. In fact, two results, which was the first one is the derivative of f, you see here on the left hand side. In the center, uh, that was the result of the reciprocity theorem that we obtained um, directly from, uh, for the function g of xy. And then finally, I introduced a definition this was what I la did last on the previous slide. And now we are almost there, in fact. We are going to combine this result to, in order to obtain the Lagrange multiplier theorem. And so this is how we do it. We start with the first two, the two, the first two, um, the first two equations, and you can substitute uh, dy over dx uh, from the left hand, from the first equation, from the second equation into the first equation, and you obtain this result. And what you notice in this equation is that these terms are actually nothing else than the definition of lambda. So I can write this here. So that's already a very important equation that's highlighted in red. And the second thing is that simply rearranging the definition of lambda, which again is, is, uh, is fine, it was just an introduction of a number. And I can do this by, um, by simply rearranging the dg over dy, and I obtain this equation. And of course, if you are perceptive, which I'm certainly uh, convinced that the readers who made it so far are perceptive, you see here that these two equations are nothing else, if you put them together, of the component of the gradient of f minus lambda g at x naught y naught. Here, I explicitly say it's calculated x naught y naught. And this is exactly the Lagrange multiplier theorem. So just to remind you, this equation allows you to minimize f under the constraint of g equal to zero, okay? And the lambda is going to give you the strength of the constraint. So this is the way it works. This is a formal proof of the Lagrange multiplier. In the next one minute or so, I'm going to give you a quick geometrical interpretation. I invite you to look maybe on YouTube for further geometrical interpretation that with many more results, but I just want to give you a, a, a preview here. Uh, I took this, this nice figure from the Wikipedia page, and when we write that the minimization problem is obtained from the gradient of f minus delta g, uh, what uh, here on this plot, what we mean is really that to find the minimum of f with the constraint g. Okay, this is really what we are trying to do. Now, what it turns out, what it means really is that if we plot the isocontour of function f, what we would like to do is to go to the smallest isocontour that still crosses the constraint g. Equal, in this case, it's equal c. In our example, we use g equals zero, but that's, that's the same thing. Um, so just to repeat, we want to get the smallest isocontour of f that still touches g, and in fact, when we say that still touches z, we, that this makes sense because think about it for a second. Imagine that we were at a lower contour. Imagine that the minimum would be at a lower contour than, than f equal d1. Then in that case, that contour would, would miss g. So that would, the constraint would not be met. On the other hand, if we were at higher contour, we, could, we would not have the minimum of the function. So from that perspective, if you look at the two approaches, I either from a too low contour or too high contour, the, the one that's going to work is the one where we minimize f in spite of the presence of the, the, the um, in spite of the presence of the constraint. So in other words, when we say in spite of the, <laughs> of the constraint, we are 
barely missing the constraint, I should say. Well, we are not missing it. And when we say we are barely missing a function but not missing it, that means that we are tangential to that function. That's actually a, a geometrical interpretation of almost missing. It's to be uh, like raising. It's like a, a, a tangential. And of course, tangential means that what matters is the gradient of the function, which is the gradient of the function is, of course, uh, normal to, uh, to, the, to the curve at the tangential point. So that's a way to interpret the, 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 the equation. But here, really, the goal of this screencast was to provide a formal proof of uh, the equation. I thank you very much for uh, watching. And do not hesitate to put any comment, uh, if, to, to send me any comment if you have any. Thank you.